Hey, folks, today's show is sponsored by Spotify. No matter what type of podcast you're into, there's always something new to discover on Spotify. With a mix of originals and many of the world's most popular shows, listening to podcasts on Spotify is easy. Just open the app, tap browse, and dive into their growing library. Subscribe to your favorites, including this one, so you'll never miss a show. You can also download podcasts for those moments when you're up in the air or going underground. Podcasts on Spotify are streaming right now go do it up we're also sponsored by zelle cash is easy to lose and checks take a while to clear thankfully there's zelle a new way to send money to your friends and family from your banking app once you're enrolled the money moves right between almost any u.s bank accounts and typically arrives in minutes plus it's backed by major banks which means you can send money confidently just go to zellpay.com, Z-E-L-L-E-P-A-Y.com to learn more. Zell, this is how money moves. Yes, yes, yes. That triple yes at the end was my addition to the copy. Let's do the show. Lock the gate! All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fucksters? What the fuckadelics? What the fuck, Nicks? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. Wow, did I just say my name weird? I'm Mark Marin. This is my show, WTF. Welcome to it. How are you? Everybody okay? Thanks for all the excited feedback about the James Franco episode. Seems that people really dug it. It was good. Nice long one. Dug in. Did a lot of listening. I've been doing a lot of listening lately. More listening than I'm generally known for. Usually I'm known for listening and interjecting. And now, now I'm just experimenting with just listening. We should all do some listening. Anyway, there's actually a sign in my garage that says, what people need is a good listening to. Someone sent that to me. It was a gift. I took it as a gift and as a not a passive aggressive thing. Super fan Amy years ago, I think, sent that to me. I think it was her, but... uh yeah, so that's just up there, and, and now I'm referring to it. Because at some point, I'm going to have to dismantle this shrine of listening here at the garage, but not soon. Doesn't seem like it's going to be soon. I'm here now. I'm here in it. I'm doing the show. Today on the show, uh, I'm going to talk to uh, my old friend Judd Apatow. He's got a special. And Loudon Wainwright, who also Judd has used in movies. They're not together. Two different talks. But that's uh, that's what's ahead. That's what's ahead for you. But first, Europe. Hello, Europe. I'm coming to see you this spring, Europe. Monday, April 16th in London, England. Thursday, April 19th in Stockholm, Sweden. Sunday, April 22nd in Oslo, Norway. Monday, April 23rd in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And Thursday, April 26th in Dublin, Ireland. It's, uh, it's my few parts of the world tour. Go to WTFPod.com and check out the tour page to get venue and ticket information. All right? I'm coming for a little while. I don't, that is the tour I planned. I want to go see some places. I want to see the world before it burns. I'd like to see some parts of the world before they're gone. I'd like to get out and enjoy my life now that I've worked so hard all these years before it goes away. See, I'm trying to be, that's those two tones. That's the upbeat. And then I I just undercut it with the, uh, with the uh, terrified. Oh my God. It's terrified, but not, uh, but not running. Like, oh no, unbelievable. But, uh, yeah, so it's been an interesting week. I haven't talked to you since last week, but I think I recorded that before, uh, most of California was on fire and before I, uh, was nominated for a Critics Choice Award. See how it comes, the yin and the yang. Hey, is that fire going to consume my new house? I don't know. I don't know if it is. Do I, it's time to spend some time watching fire apps, watching fire maps, watching for when the fire comes. I feel horrible for people who lost property, lost pets, lost homes, not in that order necessarily, uh, whose lives were compromised by these fires, but there are fires all over fucking California and it's terrifying because the brain just seeks to make like, I, you know, there's always been fires, right? Not like this. Just like, I don't know, a fire might break out in the fucking garage in three minutes. It's just like spontaneous fires. But most of the people I know up north and uh, and around uh, people I come in contact with at work, uh, their homes are okay. But again, uh, 
uh, I, I, I hope everything's okay out there for everyone. I feel bad for people that, uh, that got compromised by these fires, but it's not, this can't, is it the, is this normal now? Like I've always been kind of nervous about California in general. I, I can't, I want to run, man. But then it's like nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. And I believe there are some places to run and there are a few places to hide. But, uh, I dug in, I dug in, I got a new place and, uh, I guess if it's going to go down, it's going to go down. But I've actually done jokes about this, about these fires and about you years ago. That's just crazy. I went out and uh, Sarah, the painter, got some emergency kits. We got that. I guess I'm going to have to get a generator. One way or the other, you better be preparing for the end of something. And I'm not saying that in a tone of terror or existential despair. It's a practical term. Prepare for the end. All right. On the other side of the fires, I was nominated for a Critics' Choice Award. Uh, let, I'll talk about that in a moment. Sure. I, let's, let's see. I'm just going to shift the tone. You look, how about this? There are only a couple more weeks left in the holiday season, folks. So your time to mail and ship things is running thin. Avoid the last minute hassles of mailing and shipping and let stamps.com help you get things done on time. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. Then your mail carrier picks it up. Stamps.com makes it easy. They'll send you a digital scale, which automatically calculates exact postage. Stamps.com will even help you decide the best class of mail every time. Print postage any day, any time of day, because Stamps.com is always open. I don't need the holidays to stress me out. I'm stressed out no matter what. And one thing that's great about Stamps.com is it never causes me any stress. I know that anything I need to ship will get sent on time and with the right postage. And right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments go to stamps.com click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in wtf that's stamps.com enter wtf so yeah i'm excited a, a critic's choice nomination i look folks for me i didn't anticipate being nominated for anything ever you know i thought the one shot we had was a peabody but they they didn't they they poo-pooed it the Peabody's poo pooed us, I guess. I thought that was the one that would that would have been the one possible, the one window of opportunity to get any accolades. I certainly didn't anticipate getting any accolades for acting or for anything for stand up. I I don't know. I, I'm not being falsely humble. I just like looking at my life. It just was not part of any of the uh, the possibilities. But so so the Critics Choice Award is a is a welcomed excitement. And I am uh, grateful for it. And I'm excited about it. And uh, Glow, the show, got several. Alice and Brie got one. Betty Gilpin got a nomination. I think the, the show got a nomination. So everybody on set was excited. And we needed that excitement over the last few days because uh, we were we were shooting the show up in Pomona on a set that, uh, God, I don't want to spoil anything. Would it spoil anything? I, but what, what, maybe it'll just provide, it'll provide suspense. We were on a, uh, a hospital set in Pomona for two days, uh, 12 hour shoots running well into the evening, one or two in the morning. So it was nice to have the extra added excitement of, uh, of knowing that we're, the show is getting this recognition. It was, uh, it was fun times. I'm trying, you know, on a day to day basis for whatever reason, I experience a great deal of uh, dread and terror in my head. And I, I know many of you know this and I'm not experiencing it right now, but I actually had a moment on set the other night where it's like, look, I wait around a long time to do three lines on Friday night. We had shot all day. I was there. We were there from like 12 to one in the morning. And we did, I did one scene in the morning, which was a fun scene, no lines, but it was a fun. It was me and Allison and Betty and Chris Lowell. And then uh, pretty much I waited around like eight hours, about eight hours. And they did everyone's coverage. All the women were there, you know, all 13, 14 of them. And we covered everything except my point, you know, my coverage with where the camera is on me. It was the last shot of the night of a 12 and a half hour night at one in the morning. And uh, and and for some reason, instead of um, feeling like, well, fuck, man, what kind of gig is this? What what is all this waiting around this acting business? I just locked in and i'm like make it a good few minutes man this is what you wait for this is what acting is enjoy this minute and a half 
and just, you know, act the shit out of it. I was doing a, a, a beat with the, all of them that had a beat with Betty, who's great, great actress. And, and we just had the moment and it felt very rewarding. That's a step in the right direction. <laughs> it wasn't like, man, was that worth waiting for? I'm trying to tell you that I turned a corner and I, I, I've grown to appreciate, hey, if this is the window, if this is the moment, if this is where I get to act on this episode, if these two lines are where it's at for the day, then lean in, man. And I guess that's pretty good advice for anybody. Like if you have those moments where you got to show up and do your job, you know, fully focused, you know, if for even if it's only for a half an hour that it's expected out of you and you spend the other 12 hours, you know, looking at a computer or pretending to work, make the best out of that. Make the best out of that half hour. Make the best out of that five minutes, man, because it's all burning. Everything is on fire. Oh, my God. So Judd came by because he's got a special. Judd Apatow, The Return, premieres tomorrow, December 12th on Netflix. And we got into it. It's always good to see Judd. It's always good to have a chat. And it always ends up longer than we think. And it always ends up pretty engaged because, uh, you know, we do what we do. So this is me uh, hanging out with Judd Apatow for a bit. That's the thing about your special. Let's start there. Technique-wise, you bold motherfucker yep. used a wireless. There was no aversion to using a fucking wireless? At least I didn't go with the Janet Jackson, uh, you know, McDonald's yeah. uh, wireless. <laughs> no, you can't do head. that. No, no, no. Of course not. But I don't trust wireless mics. I'm like some weird old timey guy. <laughs> like if I don't know that it's connected to something and they always seem bulky and they don't slide yes. in and out properly and you just went yeah. ahead and used it. Well, I, uh, I have a different issue, which is. I am not that professional as a comedian, and I will constantly trip over the cord. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew that. You're like, I prefer not to have more mess up here than necessary. I, I, I literally find myself at the comedy store tripping over the cord so often that uh, when they said we have a cordless, I was like, yes, thank you. <laughs> Didn't thank even think you. about it. <laughs> so I, you know, I watched you work on a lot of the material for uh, for months and months. And um, and then I, I I didn't know like a you know a third of it. Where were we hiding that stuff? Did you just pull it out that night? Well, what's interesting is you know when you do the improv and the comedy store, there's so much material that just doesn't work there. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, longer stories, yeah. things that take time when you need people to pay more attention. So, right. You know, there was always a larger hunks that that worked in theaters or places where people were. Paying oh, so you more were working. Attention. You were working that stuff out elsewhere. Yeah, certain bits where I thought, well, this is an eleven minute the poem bit. bit. Yes, the poem bit. I read a, I read a poem <laughs> that I wrote when I was uh, fourteen when my parents were getting divorced, yeah. which I, I stumbled onto, and it's so sad, but makes me laugh so much. I wrote poems in exactly the same cadence. That there was a, a weird kind of naive social importance, yes, <laughs> to what you're saying, and the D- Dr. Seuss rhyme scheme. Yeah, but you had a little <laughs> free verse there. There was a little, it was it wasn't all Dr. Seussy. What I found interesting about finding this poem, one is that the poem is basically saying, I'm an enormous amount of pain, but maybe this pain will one day make me a good comedian. And I wrote that when I was 14. <laughs> That's basically what the poem is about. You, you already knew. <laughs> but, you know, when I was a kid, I had this sense that I was supposed to be good at certain things if I wanted to be in comedy. Yeah. And so... And I tried everything. I, I tried juggling pins. I, I tried to write sketches. I just took a quick pop at everything. What, what were the other ones? Guitar playing? Guitar like, playing I was terrible at. You know, I, I like to be... that you went with the juggling. Did you figure out how to get the balls in the air? I could juggle the pins. Then I bought the fire pins no, that you could light on. on fire. And then never worked up the courage to light them. <laughs> and that's why it took you so long to make a special. Exactly. <laughs> I was so afraid. <laughs> and then one day I wrote a poem. Uh-huh. And it's it's interesting. It's a real yeah. window into how my brain works uh, or worked at the time. But the, I find the most interesting part is I never wrote a poem again. Right. So I wrote this long poem. And then in my head, I must have thought, yeah, you're not good at this. Yeah. And stopped, which is a metaphor for my stand-up career. <laughs> you know, my brain wants to shut it down. <laughs> but oddly... Uh, and I, you know, cause I wrote poetry in college and I took it seriously at some point, yeah, even after high school, even after my big Ginsbergian, uh, assault on, uh, on the, the world we live in at 14. Um, 
I, you know, I, I, I think that writing comedy is poems. I think that jokes are poetic. There's rhythm. There's, there, there's a, a turn of phrase. There's yes. a lot of things that are, are very poetic elements. Yeah, I agree. Every once in a while when something's worded perfectly, it feels a little poetic. This is the one that is so truthful, but I was proud of this thought. And it's so simple, but I talk about how my 15-year-old just seems so unhappy to be in the house sometimes with yeah. me and my wife. Right. And and I, I say, you know, when uh, you have four people, it is a family. When it is three, it is a, a child observing a weird couple. <laughs> that's as close as I get to poetry. It just says it all. It's like a haiku. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, so, th- I mean, arguably, I think that you committed your life to poetry. That's the way I'm going to look at it. I like it. I mean, I would have liked to have been a poet, but where do you really go with that? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like maybe you got a couple books that nine people read and you teach somewhere. That's the best that you could hope for. Yeah, that always re- a- leads to the, the debate how many people do you need to watch your stuff or like your stuff? Well, you well, I mean, you know the answer to that. I need it to work in China. <laughs> I need it to work in Russia. <laughs> That's the funny thing in the business now is everything about the business is like, will things work overseas? <laughs> and and you get in these meetings where there's a subtle subtext, which is like, you know, is there anything you could chuck in it, like a, a, a <laughs> an actress from another country that might bring in the Spanish crowd? And then when you try it, it yeah. never works. You always bomb in the country of the foreigner you put in. But did, you've the tried movie. that. You've done that. Well, just in the sense that sometimes we work with people from other countries because we love them, not not to right, do it right, for a marketing right. reason. But I've never felt a bump in that country because, because <laughs> I, I had the Russian guy in a few scenes. <laughs> but they do want you to think that way. And they also, uh, you know, are, are trying to reach people that don't understand verbal humor. Yeah. So there's also this feeling generally yeah. that, you know, movies work best when you're blowing up shit. Blowing up shit or just like very broad physical comedy or expressions. Uh, yes. it's And, and, you, and you, yeah. you think, I don't know how to reach people in other countries. And every once in a while, a movie blows up around the world. You yeah. have no idea why. Uh, we made this movie um, called Begin Again. Yeah. Uh, and it was a Mark Ruffalo uh, movie that John Carney, the guy who made Once Made. Yeah. And it did okay in the United States. In, in South Korea. Yeah. Makes twenty five million dollars. That movie. It's gigantic. It's gigantic in one country on earth. South Korea loves Kira Knightley in a musical, uh, and we don't know why. You, you can't try to appeal because you'll never figure There's it no, out. You can't. You can't manufacture lightning in a bottle. There's it just no, happened. There was no part of the process where I thought South Korea's going to love this. This is going to kill there. <laughs> we got an ace in the hole in South Korea. Uh, so. I like that the special and that, you know, your whole approach to stand up, given your your 20 year hiatus, was yes. it? Uh, it was yeah, 22 years, a 22 year hiatus yeah. <laughs> from when you did the young comedian special. 19 what? 92. 92. And then you go on, you make a billion dollars, you make a lot of movies, TV shows, you write jokes for other comics. And now finally you feel confident enough. <laughs> <laughs> to get back to what you started out doing. But the reason I bring it up is because I thought you were very humble and you had a lot of humility around uh, the approach. You didn't come in swaggering. You you no. were you were sort of like I know where I'm at. I'm you know I'm I'm a I'm a, I'm a strong feature at this point. <laughs> I always say that the uh the only show since I started pursuing stand up aggressively uh-huh. in uh, 2014 where I really felt like I did badly and got nervous was one night at the comedy cellar when you walked in the room. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Come that, on. I got really self conscious <laughs> and and I had just started, maybe I had been doing it a few months again. Me? And you walked in the room and on stage all I thought was Marin knows this sucks. <laughs> and I didn't feel that way with, you know, Ray Romano watching or wow. any, anybody watching. Dice <laughs> Clay was watching me one night. I just for some reason, oh, I uh, I felt so connected to you that he, the voice in my head that's telling me that I suck, 
is also Mark Maron's voice. <laughs> <laughs> so when I finally was doing well enough that you would indicate to me, like, it's going good. You got some good stuff. I really relaxed generally. <laughs> Just recently? <laughs> Just recently. You'd be like, stuff's looking good. Or I, you know, the best compliment is when you hear from someone else, like, Maron said you got some good shit. I'm like, oh, thank God. Or I'd hear like, Attell said you're funny now. <laughs> oh, okay. you got one of those? Oh, that was a big one. That's the, a huge one. The Attell likes that's, yeah, that, that's, what, that's the one we all want. Exactly. It's for him to say anything about yeah. you. But I, you know, when I started doing it again, yeah. it's, it's so funny because I was so into stand-up from the time I was 17 to 24, yeah. but really from the time I was 10 to 24, that when I stopped, I was pretty burnt out at just doing seven days a week of nothing but thinking about jokes, writing jokes, yeah. watching comedians. So I didn't even look at comics for a decade. And only maybe around 2010, 11, did I go, what's everybody doing? I didn't yeah. even go to the improv for right. 15 years, probably. Right. Really? Even to watch. So I didn't even... And then I started feeling like, even as a comedy producer, I should know what's happening. Yeah, but that sounds like somebody who like you know quit something like that was hurting them, and and uh, but they had no control. It's like an addiction. Like I can never go back to where that's happening. I just <laughs> lost interest. In really? It. Not. It wasn't anger. I felt just bored of watching it, and and then slowly, I'm trying to think who was. I the, think that's the, a the, grown up thing. Who was the comedian that got me excited again? I don't. I started watching Hannibal a little bit. Yeah. And he was making me laugh. I think watching, uh, you know, so, you know, there was a few people that I thought, wow, like Maria Bamford. Oh, I, yeah. I, I remember hearing her on your show. Yeah. You you drove somewhere with yeah, her. Yeah, right, yeah. And I was really taken by that. Oh, yeah. And, that you, was, and you not seen her before that? No. Oh, man. And then I started looking that up. And then I, and then I realized, oh, there's some amazing yeah, people right. who are a lot better than the people when I started. And different you know, I mean, yeah, yeah sure. There was, there's always some slouches around. Yes. But, you know, there were some great guys then, too, yeah. when we started or like whenever that was. 92, you said the Young Comedian Special was? Yes. And I, so I started in 89, I think, officially, you mm -hmm. know, making money. Yeah. 80, probably 87, 88, doing it. But there were good people around, but there was, you know, the remnants of the road of that first wave. Yeah. And there were a lot of those kind of, you know, uh, mid level headliners yeah. with, uh, <laughs> you know, rap closers or yes. somersaults. But there was always like, you know, there were some people in, in the generation before us where you're like, well, that was really unique. Those guys are really sure. sort of doing something completely different. And there's a lot of them around now. I mean, back then it really was. Hicks, yeah. you go see Bill Hicks for that for that thing. The, he, yes. he was singular in that. Yes. Stephen Wright was singular in that. Yes. in his thing, Goldthwait. Yeah, when you would go see him in the late eighties, and of course Kinnison, who to this day, I've never seen anyone more exciting to watch. Just, yeah, just menacing. Just to electric see, to see Kinnison. Uh, before the crowd knew who he was, was the most exciting comedy you've ever seen. And it really can't be recaptured. Like, people walk in a room not knowing this guy's coming and not knowing the joke, the point of view, and he starts screaming at them. Yeah. The place yeah. it would erupt. Half the place would walk out. Yeah. And there's no one like that now. This is an exciting panic. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I actually, for some reason, I, on uh, on the random thing on my iPod in the car, the, the album went on. I have, like, that first yeah. album, Hotter Than Hell, or louder than hell, you can't, it's not on CD, so someone's gotta rip it. And yeah. someone ripped it at some point and gave it to me. And I listened to the whole thing through, and I've always been a guy that listens to that once a year, and I had experiences with him. And then, like, this was the first time where I was sort of like, nah, that was really kind of wrong minded and shitty, that one. <laughs> Well, it's all so awful. Yeah. I, like, I remember laughing. I mean, I knew it was, but like, it, it, I felt the slight offense for the first time. <laughs> so, like, you know, he was definitely a monster, but that it, the, the intensity and the, the balls of it all, you don't see that much. I, it felt like, I guess looking back, if you, you were to try to define the Sam Kennison character, it would be the world has broken him. Yes. And so, in a way. And the world will pay. <laughs> And so you enjoyed it from that point of view yeah. that he was, it, it was a person in meltdown. So his opinions, which were so wrong at times, yeah. you never felt like the joke was he believes it. You felt like this is what happens 
when you oh, get broken. Cautionary tale. Yes, you just right. completely lose your mind and start screaming at yeah. starving people yeah. to go to the food. Yeah. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense at all. Punching way down. Yes. Punching as down <laughs> as you can punch. Exactly. He's so fr- <laughs> Because I always took it like, it's the frustration that life is unkind yeah. that makes you go, what are we going to do? I don't know. Go to the fucking food. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. But it doesn't make any sense at all. That, that way he captures that whole thing with where it's like, you know, you're sitting there eating what you pulled together. Like, he, he phrased it. Like, he was just sitting in front of the television set with some shitty dinner that he pulled together for himself. And there's a starving guy on TV, a starving kid. Yeah. And it just, just infuriated him. <laughs> and it, isn't that just a cover for an inability to feel sadness? That you do feel so sad that you just start screaming nonsense because you can't go to that vulnerable place right, that, that just wants to cry about that kid. Yeah, you're, you're broke. Your heart broken. Now it's exploding. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> all over everybody. Unless we're just totally wrong, and he was just a, a monster. Prick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was definitely, there was some of that. But, but okay. But like what I was saying, though, like I was impressed, and I, I entered the, uh, the, the, the Apatow return. You know, seeing you around as, you know, like I was uh, not that I needed to defend you, but I'm like, wait, people were surprised. I'm yes. like, he was writing jokes for uh, some of our favorite comics when he was a child. <laughs> what you, like, you're gonna, what you think he's gonna have a hard time putting together an act? <laughs> you know, I mean, did you ever, did you think, I mean, as a joke writer, and you drew from your life, you know, very frankly, that you were gonna have a hard time putting together an act? It, it, I think what it is is that I didn't think about it too much. I just slowly slid into it. Yeah. I think what helped me a lot in doing it again. Yeah. One was I didn't need to do it to pay my rent. Right. And I didn't need to beg for spots. So I was very lucky that I had enough recognition that clubs yeah. would put, put me up as a freak show anyway. At but least no, in the beginning. You're, you're not like Steve O. I mean, you're Judd Apatow. You're like... <laughs> but just, there was something amusing about seeing me right. attempt to do it. Yeah. The other thing that helped me a lot is I didn't know who any of the comics were. So when I started going up at the cellar, yeah. I didn't know almost anybody. So I didn't have the fear of everybody because at the time I didn't understand how much better they were than me. Or yeah, where they stood in the hierarchy. Yes. Or like, you know. I didn't know, like, oh, that's how funny, you know, Keith Robinson is. Oh, yeah. And I should, you know, yeah. I should be nervous around him sure. because he's yeah. killed yeah. every single night. Yeah. And all those guys, you know, Greer Barnes and. Wow. You know, Greer Barnes. <laughs> you know, all these people were like, were so funny. And then yeah. I would slowly watch them. But at the very beginning, I just hadn't watched comedy in a long time. So when I would go in and I would sit at the table with all the comics, I didn't even know their acts to right. know who I was sitting with sure. most of the time. Right. And then by the time I figured out who everyone was, I had enough of my sea legs to not be too embarrassed, but I was embarrassed. Like, no, oh, this is kind of weird that I'm uh, attempting to do it, but I always felt like everyone realized that I love it so much. But you, but you were this is, but you were a comic. Yes. I mean, that's the weird thing is like, I would have thought that, you know, sitting down with them, that, that, that you would have thought that they were projecting like, what does this guy need to do this for? Why is he here? I didn't, I didn't get that from people. Oh, the, well, then I hit it well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah. But you know what? Maybe that was what people were thinking. Just, just what is happening right now? Every once in a while, I would see someone get quiet. You know, I'd sit at the comedian's table, just someone very chatty would just stop talking. <laughs> And I thought, God, I hope I, you know, like, the, my presence here isn't making people self-conscious. Uh, right. But then slowly, you don't want them walking. You're going home at two thirty, going like I fucked up with appetite, <laughs> which is so never, not why I'm there at all. <laughs> right. uh, but but everyone was so nice. I really fell in love with everyone there, and you know, Esty uh, and Gnome, they yeah. just were very inviting. The club was excited to have me uh, work there, and then. I worked my ass off. I wrote, you know, a you ton did. of jokes to try to. I tried to be worthy of it. I really respected all the the comedians and thought I got to get good enough that I could, yeah. I could think I'm as I'm you know I'm the same level of these people. But, like I'm, I was watching the special and you were just it was all loaded up with like little one line pieces that I never heard before and di- I didn't get it all the way to the end. Did you do the Cosby bit? I do. Yeah, near the end. Like and like yes. that. That I love that bit and I love the uh, the all the kids stuff. I mean, and and to sort of admit. Like and and you sort of had to because you weren't going to go up and and just do you know detached jokes. Yes. But you do you, you know you present your life as it is. 
Yes. You know, I am a rich producer of film and television. <laughs> I live a very, a very, you know, uh, gilded life. Is that the word? Yes. Uh, but, you know, you know, problems remain. <laughs> well, that is the one thing that you notice, and I'm sure from your new uh, perch and your new home, you will notice as well that uh, that once you can pay your bills, yeah. Uh, and I always say this that you know people who have succeeded and what they've tried to do and have a little money, they they spend their whole lives thinking when I, when this happens, that yeah. happiness will arrive, and then when it happens, you realize, oh, I'm still unhappy. It's me. Well, it's yeah, all me. but yeah, but I don't know that I ever thought that happiness would arri- arrive. And but I do feel there are some things I don't have to worry about, like yeah. I used to. That used to consume me. Yes, but I mean, but when you really think about how is that going to change you to have? But I, I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I am getting a new house, and I walk around it, and I'm like, it, it feels different. Like, but you know, I'm 54. Yeah. You, you know, <laughs> you know, like, I, you know, I better do something to 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 feel like that I've I've arrived somewhere. It's hard to think that. Uh, you deserve it, you know that right. that you've worked a long time, and I'm allowed to have the room, you know, with the big TV. Yeah, and I'm going to work hard on the sound. Yeah, <laughs> like but you do think I don't deserve this. You, there is that, you know, why fraud. Is that? I, get, well, I don't fucking know why that is. I mean, I I, I feel that a little bit, but I, I I guess for me, it's more like you know, like, do I need it? It's not, it's not yeah. even. It's, exactly. it's not like deserve. It's sort of like, you know, I'm okay here, but this house is falling the fuck apart and I've not even yeah. fixed anything. And like when I empty it, I, I, it's going to be like they should just demo it. Yeah. Like, well, there's a point of pride in not being an asshole in the nice house. Yeah. And that's a that's a, a difficult thing. I, I don't think I use much of it in, in the special, but I do talk a, a lot about... People who always want more, like if you're the Koch brothers and you have $35 billion and you are obsessed with getting all of these congressmen to push for a tax cut so you could make $2 billion more of which you'll never spend a penny, what is going on in your mind? What are your values? At the cost of people's lives? Yes. <laughs> quality of life, the yes. country, the yeah. globe, at food the stamps. Earth. Can we get can we get rid of food stamps so yeah. I can get a, a tax cut? And and I think that is what's driving all of us mad is that Trump is a symbolic of very wealthy people and it's not enough. Yeah. And as someone who you know doesn't have to feel terrible if I get a parking ticket, I don't get it at all because other than sending my kids to school and having a place to live, there's nothing to spend money on. Right. All you really spend money on generally is you might go on a vacation yeah. and you might get the extra appetizer <laughs> and that's about it. Like, <laughs> why do you need, like, why does Trump need to say I'm worth 10 billion? If he was worth 900 million, it's, yeah. what, what, what the fuck is the difference? Well, he, he also has mental problems and he needs yes. to win and he's a bully and there's, <laughs> Yeah, and, and and he seems to be at the beginning stages of some degenerative mental condition. You think that's it? People are beginning to say that openly, like something's happening. Well, apparently his father had it, and his sister yeah. is it has it now. Uh, is completely incapacitated with uh, degenerative mental you know, illness. Reagan, uh, you know, ran the country for several several, several years. years. Yeah, just push uh, him out there. Remember those <laughs> Iran uh, Contra uh, uh, interviews he did? Uh uh-uh. uh He he had to do a deposition. Yeah. Not good. It wasn't. It wasn't the best shining <laughs> moment on the hill. Well, uh, so the special looked good. You, well, you did. How many did you shoot? Nine. <laughs> I shot two shows a night for two nights. Okay. Uh, I, I shot four shows. Yeah. The night before the first show in the same theater, I did a warm up show to get used to this. Space. So you did five. Uh, yeah, and I I didn't tape that one, and it went so badly. Okay. <laughs> and good. And people told me that would happen. But when it happens, when you run the full set, and, it's, and, and, it's, and you just can't get over the you, hump, you, you can't. It, it felt like every joke was starting over. Uh, yeah, it was the worst. And some jokes would work, yeah. but every joke, and it, it was like Canadian people yeah. who were so polite yeah. that they just their energy never lifted. But no, but I thought the thing it looked great. Who directed it? Um, it was uh, Marcus Ramboy. Is he one of your guys? Uh, he is just a great uh, comedy director who who did Pete Holmes special, and he does a lot of them. And I thought oh, I don't know how to do this, and and he did a a, a beautiful. Yeah, job and the with suit it. was nice. Uh, the suit was nice. Who's, who's, um, who makes that suit? 
I, I don't know, but professionals were involved. <laughs> it's my punch, punch drunk glove. It's a punch drunk glove yeah. suit. No, but you look good in a suit. Like, I could yeah. never, like, I don't think I could pull a suit off. I think my head's too large. I don't know. I haven't worn a suit in a long time. I look okay in a suit. I look a little bit like an agent, but my body mm. is so wrongly shaped. It's just, I'm very, I'm, you is know, I, I get a little pear shaped. Uh -huh. So I decided a few years ago. Uh, and my wife is not thrilled about this. Yeah. That the only shirt I looked good in was a black James Purse polo shirt. I bought 25 of them. Oh, I see you in that a lot. Yeah. And, and I just decided I'm not even going to pretend I look good in other clothes. <laughs> you did wear that a lot. And then I lost some weight yeah. so I'd look okay. Yeah. For the, for the special. And then right. the second we were done taping, just, just put another 10 back on. Did you? Yeah, just start eating again. And it, yeah, I just tossed it all out the window. I've been, I got my cholesterol down with, uh, without statins. I, uh, this is a big fight in my house. Is my wife is against the statins? I know. I I I got against them too because I don't I don't know really why. But you yeah. know, no one wants to be on medicine. But uh, I just cut meat and dairy out totally. That's what people say. It's all the meat. <laughs> yeah. That, that people think it's everything else, but that the your cholesterol is very meat driven. I hate any discussion of having to be healthy. Yeah. I don't like that I have to do it. Well, now it's like there's less reason because it doesn't seem like things are going <laughs> to go well. There's not a positive yes. closure ahead. So you might as well live a little. <laughs> Sometimes when, when like I'm watching the news and, and, yeah. they, and they say, hey, Trump decided to put all the nukes on B1 bombers to like be up in the air 24 hours a day. Yeah. I will eat that pint of ice cream. Sure. And I'm kind of happy that the window got smaller. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I wish, I, I think that, you know, sadly it's true. Like, you know, like, it is, I, right? I, when, when old people, like, who I respect die, I'm like, they got out. <laughs> they got out. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. um, thank God they didn't have to see this shit. You know, after yeah. what they lived through. Yes. Like, let them go now. As I get older and I feel closer to death, mm -hmm. I, I get a, a, like a feeling like where I'm excited to die. Yeah. To just get out before like the environment falls apart, before some other bad thing happens. I don't happens. know if we're going to make it, dude. I, I, it might have, we might be a, a, around for it. God damn it. I know what the <laughs> fuck we really thought was, I thought I was going to get out before the world ended, but yeah. I don't know. It used to be, you know, when I was a kid, I would yeah. think they're going to cure cancer yeah. before I get it. Yeah. And now I'm like, they're not going to. <laughs> but, <laughs> They've done real good with some of them. Really depends yeah. which one you get. And I can't slip out mm -hmm. before the really bad stuff happens. Yeah. It becomes harder to create silly comedy in the face of this. It becomes harder to do anything. Yeah. That, 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 that is pleasurable or not. Uh, or not requiring because there's part of you that thinks like we're in an urgent situation yes. and I should be doing something urgently but you run out of there the, what what so then yeah. like with that kind of percolating and the news percolating when you just want to go like watch a movie or enjoy something or play some guitar it's there's part of you that's sort of like why why do this even exactly why not just sit <laughs> Like I remember, you know, being home, yeah. and uh, you know, kicking, you know, jokes around with uh, Seth and Evan for Pineapple Express. Yeah, like, oh, it'd be funny if he tries to kick out the windshield of the car, <laughs> yeah, and it, his foot just gets stuck. And then we would, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, when they like pitched it, we would just giggle for fifteen minutes. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know if that kind of moment is possible right now, where I you're so lost in the silly. Uh, fantasy land. I, and I was talking to a, 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 someone about this for hours last night that as a Jew, yeah. I feel like we're supposed to pay attention right now. And yeah. I'm, not, I'm not even religious, but I have a feeling of like my whole life I thought, why didn't they do something about all this, you know, during World War II? Yeah. And it feels like if I shut it all off and write silly jokes, I'm abdicating some responsibility. And then my, my friend was saying, no. The way you change the world is through your art, and that teaches people about love and connection and compassion, and everything you do to protest everything that's going on doesn't matter at all or anywhere near as much as the messages you slyly send through your comedy or your movies. And how that sit with you? You know, you know what I think of? Yeah. I just think of trains of Jews going into camps, yeah. <laughs> and I just think, aren't I supposed to be like on the on the train tracks? stopping it yeah and i think that's is that just a a nice notion that i'll write a movie now that comes out in three and a half years but how did that help people in puerto rico who have no water right and aren't we supposed to well what yeah but like what but what what see the thing is is like would you be able to do the type of grunt work 
necessary to get your hands dirty and, and help out in a practical way, in an immediate yeah. way. Well, the yeah, immediate yeah. way I do it is I just try to raise money. Good. Right? So I do, you know, I do an enormous amount of benefits. Oh, what and, is the uh, the uh, ACLU thing? I I, they, I got an invitation. Should I go? Uh, yeah, I'm going to get uh, some sort of a recognition from the ACLU. As soon as the Trump thing hit, I said, I got to figure out what to do so I don't go crazy. One of the main things is I'm going to raise money for the ACLU. Yeah. Because so much of what slows I immediately Trump down. Sent them num- I immediately sent them money. Yeah. Just, okay. You need lawyers... And, and a lot of what has stopped yeah. uh, the terrible things he's done, uh, the transgender ban in the military or the yeah. travel bans, is because the ACLU is suing them. Right. So, and then I think, well, I still get to do comedy. Yeah. I could strong arm friends into doing yeah. shows, and at least it's doing something. So that's one thing I try to do. Well, I think that's true. I think that's right because, yeah. like, I think that you know, on the other side, where people are just thrilled at, you know, I I realize that what's happened because of a tone of an email I got is that. That these people that had the, that hated Obama, that hated uh, progressive, uh, culturally progressive m- movements in uh, in all areas, just became they were enraged, and then they became exhausted by ha- being forced to tolerate things. Yeah. And then 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 once they didn't have to anymore, the fury just came out, the fury yeah. of intolerance. So now their condescending position is like, well, now you guys have to tolerate, you know. <laughs> This this horrendous intolerance and hostility and racism and hate we had to put up with with you guys with making, love yeah, with love <laughs> and open hearted shit open minded <laughs> garbage now that you know so so like for me like I, I think what we have to do as a service to ourselves but also to the country is not fall into despair yeah. and let that become like just like it's, it's i think that authoritarian regimes you know feed on on hopelessness despair and and the reality that people are are not really able to do anything about it yeah. and and we're so confused that how much we're lied to you know for instance uh people already have forgotten about the vegas shooting yeah we're five insane things past that already and that was just weeks ago yeah Yeah, everything like there's something about there's an old hicks joke you remember the joke he did i can't i was just paraphrasing it about watching the tv it's like death destruction war (laughs) right and then you know you open the door it's like crickets like there there's some profound idea about you know what you allow into your head what you allow it to do and what your reality is and what you can do so the the question becomes: Can I stay positive? Can I think of constructive things to do while you know putting up my resistance and writing boner jokes? Yeah, simultaneously. Sure. No, the boner jokes are important because if there's no humor, then there's just the hopelessness. And and yes. then you know, but yeah, but let's talk about before we go. Like I watched the rough cut of the Gary Shandling doc, and uh, it's a beautiful right. a beautiful thing. You're one of the few people who've seen it. Yeah, it was very touching. I loved it. And like I said to you, and I think I've told you before, and you knew him well, and you put this stuff together from archive footage, from his notebooks, from all the things you had access to in his life. And it's a, you know, it's a beautiful kind of, uh, memorial of a friend and mentor. But like that, that, uh, memorial ser- uh, service that I went to, the show, what would you call that? A memorial? Uh, yeah, we did a memorial for Gary at the Wilshire Ebell. And right. And a lot of people spoke. And, and I cut together l- little documentary uh, sequences about different parts of but, Gary's life. But just learning about him changed my life. Because I talked to him, and I don't know that I re- appreciated his comedy with the depth necessary, with the depth that was uh, that was there, that it deserved. Mm-hmm. And, and also his process. And, you know, you turning me on to him and then having me go to that thing and then we did the 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 green room together and I got to you know sort of I always liked him but I never knew on some weird level how much I had in common with him yeah I think that's emotionally I think that's what most people uh, are realizing is that they didn't know him as well as they wished they did yeah although people don't people don't really have the courage to dig you know if, if like you're in a unique position because you do get the moment with someone where you're allowed to ask the questions people will not ask in conversation. Yeah, sometimes I can do it. Yeah, so every yeah. once in a while you could just you know turn to someone like Gary Shandling and go, "Why are you like this?" Yeah, and and get answers. But in life, even as his close friend, yeah, uh, I I wouldn't often <laughs> dig for the psychological underpinnings of who he was. But when I made the documentary and I started figuring out how he became this guy and what he was doing and what he was attempting 
throughout his life to be sane and to find happiness and peace. Um, I I realized that it was, it's very powerful. I, I related to it as well. And it's sad that people didn't get to share that with him as much as they could have while he was alive. Cause he had a very interesting journey, which is the same as us, which is we're young. We, we have some difficult childhood situation. Yeah. Comedy becomes some way to escape a way to be seen. Then we want to be successful so that we feel good about ourselves. And then at some point we realize, Oh, that doesn't work. Yeah. What, what does work, which ultimately is love and connection and some higher purpose. And then we go for that, which is still, difficult and uh, uh, you know very hard to attain and then we then we get killed in that North Korea bomb <laughs> no <laughs> right as we're about to feel that peace yeah finally but, <laughs> <laughs> but Gary uh, had a fascinating you know story I mean the one that I love is that when he's 20 years old he went to a comedy uh, not a comedy club just a, a, a like a bar club yeah and saw George Carlin right oh yeah yeah and George Carlin is you know he's pretty new to being hippie George Carlin. Yeah, Gary writes bits for him. Yeah. I found the bits. He wrote yeah. a fake commercial for legalized marijuana. Right. So he wrote. He literally wrote the bit. What if they legalize marijuana? What would the commercial be? And so he had about five pages of bits for Carlin. He walks up to him and says, "Hey, I I, I wrote you some jokes." Ballsy for twenty. Yeah, and Carlin says, "I don't usually buy jokes, but I'll read them if you want to come back tomorrow. I'll, I'll I'll tell you what I thought." Gary comes back the next day. They're laid out on the table with like he wrote on them. He made notations, and he says to young Gary, "You know what? I don't buy jokes, but there's one great joke on every page, and I think if you you want to pursue this, you should." And Gary got in the car and just moved to California. <laughs> <laughs> and it changed his life. Yeah, yeah. He, he needed that. And you know, who wouldn't? Who knows if Carlin would have done that on any other day? Because you yes. know what that's like, right? You, you know, who is this kid? It's yes. a mood thing. Yeah. Like I, you know, like who? I don't know Carlin yeah. for you know how often he did that, but he was probably in in Arizona. What did he have to do? Yes. Right. Like you, you know what I mean? And this little ballsy <laughs> Jewish kid. It's like, I got these jokes. And he's like, I got nothing to do tomorrow. I'm right? going to read these jokes instead of going to the mall. Right. Yeah. Something. Yeah. And it, it erupt- But I think Carlin used to do that. I heard his, his daughter, Kelly Carlin, on yeah. the show. And she said he would bump into a comic. He would ask the comic for his number. And then eight months later, he would just call the guy and go, how are you doing? How's the career going? <laughs> yeah. And he would follow up in a, in a really beautiful way with people. He He knew the that power that he had. And then I found this letter and this isn't in the documentary where 10 years later or seven years later, Gary's doing like, make me laugh. You know, he's just beginning to get spots at the comedy store. And he writes a letter to Carlin thanking him for telling him to be a comedian. And he says, more important than your comedy is the man you are and how he, he wants to be a man like George Carlin, who, who, uh, you know, speaks his truth and uh, and it's it's wild, and I don't know if he sent it because I found it. It looked right. it looked like the unsent right thank you letter. Wow! And it, but it was beautiful. Uh, it really. Uh, and he was like, I wrote an episode of Welcome Back, Cotter. <laughs> <laughs> like that was going to impress George Carlin. <laughs> Maybe that's where the second thoughts came in. Yeah, I'm not going to send this. But that's going to be on in March. Great, and it's four hours. And I thought, you know what? If OJ's worth seven, Gary's yeah. got to be worth four. All right, buddy. Well, the special is great. It's called The Return. December 12th on uh Yeah, so this, uh, this is going to be, uh, this isn't going to go up for a while because we're going to hold it until we, we for to promote the thing. Yes. So, like, who knows the what world, the fuck? The world could be so different in the when this runs in three or four weeks Ivanka could be in prison by then who who knows what the, that's <laughs> that's upbeat that's an optimistic <laughs> that's the best case future. scenario <laughs> <laughs> Okay, again, Judd Apatow, The Return, premieres tomorrow, December 12th on Netflix, and it's good. He's been a latent stand-up comic for a decade or so. It's good to have him out, have him back. I did stand-up the other night at the comedy store, and um, 
I was third up in the original room, 1045 spot, second show. And I got on stage and I'd just been free forming, doing the riffage, trying to find the beats, trying to find the, 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 the path. Where's this going to go? What's this idea? How does it work? Does it have legs? But I've just been kind of having fun, riffing, trying not to freak out or freaking out in a funny way. And I get on stage and there's a guy front row, stage left, totally asleep, totally asleep. And I'm talking, I'm on the mic and you can hear it. It's loud. And I'm talking about him being asleep and I'm asking him if he's awake, if he's, if he's enjoying his nap, nothing. He's not waking up. I took a picture of the dude on stage from the stage. And yeah, obviously I was, you know, having fun. And then uh, the flash apparently woke him up. And I got to be honest with you, I felt bad I woke him up. I felt bad. Like, I, you know, it was rude that he was sleeping, but it was one of those moments where I'm like, oh, I should have just let that guy sleep. You know what I mean? I don't know his life. You know, he's in a safe place. He's in a comedy club. He came for a few laughs. Maybe he hasn't slept in days and he was hoping that the comedy would make him feel better. And he just finally got a little shut eye. Uh, he did, I think, uh, uh, end up going back to sleep. So, What's going on? Loudon Wainwright's coming up. But wait, this is kind of cool, folks, because we're sponsored today by the podcast, How Did This Get Made? And for a very specific reason, but I'll get to that in a second. But let me just say this about How Did This Get Made? First of all, I love everyone on it. The hosts have all been on the show. You've got Paul Shear, who did a great WTF episode back in the day. Jason Mansukis, who was just on earlier this year. And June Diane Raphael, who I actually interviewed in character. She was doing a bit with Matt Walsh that we never told anyone was a bit. Anyway, they're all great. And how did this get made is the three of them just sitting around making fun of, but also celebrating some of the world's craziest movies. They're always joined by a special guest, most of whom are people you've heard here on WTF. And I'll tell you a little secret about how did this get made. It's my producer Brendan's favorite podcast. Yes, he may pour his heart and soul into this show, but how did this get made is his private happy place. So that being said, why is how did this get made sponsoring today's show? Well, it has something to do with our guest last Thursday, James Franco. How did this get made just released a disaster artist special episode. Of course, the disaster artist is about making one of the most how did this get made movies of all time the room paul jason and june are all in the disaster artist and in this special episode you'll hear from the cast including franco and seth rogan and even tommy weasel the guy who started it all go ahead and subscribe to how did this get made in apple podcast stitcher or your favorite podcast app enjoy so loudon wainwright he's a very prolific folk singer and his memoir, Liner Notes, came out in the fall and is available wherever you get books. So this is me and Loudon chatting. Do you do the boat? I have a sailboat. So you know how to sail? I know how to sail, yeah. I mean, it- I, I, start, I started when I was 55, so I kind of know how to sail. I've been doing it for 15 years. Oh, it wasn't something you grew up with? No. God, it's a, uh, I got a friend who sailed around the world. Are you that proficient? No. No, I, I once <laughs> I once I once did a long sail for yeah. 5 days and that cured me of that. So you can sleep in the boat? I have a, there is a place to sleep on the boat. I I've never slept there. I had sex there once, but oh, we good. actually didn't sleep. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. It <laughs> <laughs> was that were you moving? Were you out on the water or <laughs> no. just, was it just docked? The anchor was dropped as they say. <laughs> Yeah, we were anchored. Yeah, well, well, that was good. It was that. Was that a something that you needed to get out of your system, or is that like, <laughs> like, let's fuck on a boat? It's time to fuck on a boat. I haven't done that. Let's do that. I don't know how much time I got left. Well, you know, you have a boat, and there's a place to lie down. Sure. It's actually a, a toilet, a head they call it. Yeah, and I've I, I I've used that, but uh, I said, well, so we said we should at least have sex on the boat. This is what your know. wife. This is my my other my better much better half. Yeah, uh, my girlfriend. Oh, there's a girlfriend. Yeah, I got a girlfriend. The girlfriend is is this the mother of the latest the last child? No, no, this is somebody new. That was a new one. This is somebody who works at the New Yorker. In fact, I listened to your your show with David Remnick. Which oh yeah, I greatly enjoyed. But this oh, yeah. is Susan Morrison. Okay, who's a who's a big editor at the New Yorker. Oh, that's great. So yeah. that's nice. So you, you have someone to. To have talk, sex with on a boat. Have sex on a boat with and have high-minded conversations <laughs> yeah. about things. Well, uh, yeah, so tonight, you, you flew in today. You're going you're gonna to go do a thing with Christopher Guest tonight? Mm-hmm. 
And you guys know each other a long time? About 45 years, yeah. Where did that start? Where did, how did you, like, uh, you know, like, I, I've talked to McKean, you know, do you, and you're friends with him, too? I went to college with McKean, so that's how I met Chris, actually. And David, and Landers, too? David Lander, Carnegie Tech in Pittsburgh, acting school. I was, so we're all studying to be actors. Oh, really? Yeah. And then my, and then, uh, uh, Michael and David got kicked out and, and Michael went to NYU and that's where he met Chris in the acting program. Uh huh. So when I came to New York, I, I met, uh, Chris through Michael. Oh, so they were like youngsters. Like, they yeah. they met in college. That whole thing started in college. For yeah, me. like what what years are we talking there? Like that would be what sixty <sighs> seven. Yeah, so you weren't pl- you were playing a bit, or you weren't playing. I was beginning to play. I was I was I had a, I had played guitar, and by, I was beginning to I began to write in, in sixty eight. Uh huh. So you, the original idea was to be an actor. That was the the original plan. Well, that's right, because in the book you talk about that feeling, <laughs> that feeling of. Of making people laugh on stage and just sort of like, this is where, this is it. Yeah. 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 So that was really, you You just knew you wanted to be on stage connecting. It's, it started when I was in Santa Ana. Uh, when I was about seven, I sang a song a cappella for my mother and her twin sister. Uh, yeah. uh, and these two beautiful, uh, they were, you know, 27 or whatever they were, beaming down this love and approval yeah. on me. And that... That uh, that clinched the deal for me. I knew that I did it. I, I I pretty that's, you know, I'd wanted to be a cowboy and an astronaut, but then I wanted to be a performer after they. But yeah, so like so, as a, uh, your yeah, your mom had twin sisters. So where did you? Let's. I guess we should go all the way back because it's sort of interesting to me because you grew up in these, kind of like two worlds in terms of, who your parents were. Yes. Because uh, you have a very kind of like a, there's a a fairly. Uh, high, uh, you know, falutin, highfalutin, <laughs> you know, Name. powerful bloodline, uh, you know, of America in a way. Yeah. Uh, legacy. Yeah, it's a big name, but your dad comes from a big family, right? From a like an old family. Yeah, the Wainwrights have been around for years, and uh, we're relatives with the Stuyvesants. You know, Peter Stuyvesant, sure. the one-legged governor. Yeah. So my dad grew up as a kind of uh, in the. What they call the Gold Coast of Long Island. You know. So the Stuyvesant, so that money or that family connection goes back to like pre America New York, to Dutch New York? Does it go that Yeah, Peter Stuyvesant was the first governor of New Amsterdam. Uh huh. So, right, right. Okay. So way back. Way back. Yeah, they had those, uh, like that. I, n- I never understand how that money stays around. Do you? I don't know anything about money. I, I'm really. I know you're a bad. musician, I'm a but musician. it's a, But you grew up, you, you know, in that world, right? Westchester, like, New York. You know, in the in the country clubs, mansions. The, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. We were the members of the. We were members of the Bedford Golf and Tennis Club. Uh huh. And uh, but my dad, my my, mo- my mother was from the opposite end of the social scale. She yeah. was this funky white trash chick from Tifton, Georgia. Uh huh. You know, real, really dirt poor. Her dad was an itinerant uh, tobacco farmer. Uh huh. And she had the she talked like that, loudy. Yeah, loudy. <laughs> That's so beautiful, loudy. Sing that again. That's yeah. sweet. I'm glad you had that though. Yeah. No, she was my biggest supporter. You yeah. Know, when I was being in, trying to start out singing and playing and stuff. Well, there's a, like there's a lot of kids though. There's what four of you or three of you? I have I have four and a half. Siblings. I, my dad had a had a daughter late in his life. God, you uh, guys are you know just on you on the same uh, life plan. Just just go out there and, and <laughs> fool around and see what happens. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, how old is that one? That is Anna, and Anna is th- thirty three. That's your half sister. That's my half sister, Anna. That's wild, huh? Yeah. Yeah. When did you start, like, you know, what, cause like, I listen to a lot of the music and, you know, you write very well in, 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 in the book and, and there's something about, and you seem like a pleasant man. <laughs> it's early. <laughs> <laughs> I had a nap. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's something about, like, cause I do comedy and I do very, uh, you know, personal comedy. Uh-huh. And, and it seems that you are sort of compelled to be as personal as possible as well. Yes. And it seems that, you, you know, in my own life, and I imagine in yours, that, you, you know, there's a price to pay for that. Some rough Thanksgiving dinners with the family. <laughs> 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 but when, how does that, when, we can evolve into that, but when did you start, you, you know, writing songs and what was, what, what, what drove you initially? 
Well, I, first I learned how to play the guitar and, uh, when I, you know, I had a guitar when I was 13, and I never thought I'd write songs. My dad was a writer, and writing, you know, observing him be a writer. But he was like a journalist, He was a right? journalist. He was a famous journalist. He had a column in Life magazine for for years, and he was very well known in the 60s when I was growing so up. So I guess at some, you know, you had to look up to that. You knew that your dad was famous, I, right? Yeah, I like, looked up to it, but I also looked askance at it, because I, A, I didn't want to be like him, like most snotty-nosed kids. You don't want to be like your parents. Uh-huh. And second of all, he, he seemed to be an unhappy person trying to write and meet deadlines and write books. But was he un, unhappy in general? <laughs> or... or? Uh, he was unhappy in general. Yeah, he had a he had a hard ass father, Loudon Wainwright the first. Yeah, who who died when 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 my dad was only seventeen. Uh huh. And he never got to you know work any of their stuff out. So I, uh, I, I think he was a uh, hard ass. How? Well, I never met him, but you know, get your elbows off the table and just a disciplinarian mm -hmm. and and you know, not emotional. Not not yeah. Cold, Other than angry, cold, <laughs> angry cold. or cold. I've seen pictures of him and yeah. I. Uh, in fact, there's a picture of him in the book. You can see that he's he's holding it in and not letting it. Well, what, what what I thought was interesting in the book is that in in the parts I read was that you know, and I tried to track this in my own life is that you know you have enough self awareness, you've done enough research on yourself, and and there is a to to the degree that you have, but there's this legacy. You know, there are these generations of either emotional detachment or coldness that you know you're 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 up against. Whether it's conditioned or genetic, mm -hmm. that you're propelled by these things. Yeah, you're, the deck is stacked genetically. It, it, or, yeah, or way, yeah. However, it's a, it yeah, it, the beat goes on. You know, there is a legacy of of uh, of of d depression and self loathing. But and, your dad seemed like your dad was was not. I mean, it seemed like you had a relationship with him. We. Um, you know, it, we it kind of toward the end of his life, he died. Uh, he was only sixty three when he died. Yeah. So uh, we uh, we kind of got a little closer toward the end, particularly after he got sick. Yeah. Uh, and in nineteen eighty two, which was five years or six years before he died, he and I took a trip to Australia together. I was playing there, and they threw in an extra plane ticket. My dad came with me. We were both guys then. We yeah. both had broken families and were in new relationships. Yeah. His, Anna had just been born, so he was a new dad. He was a 59-year-old new dad. That's wild, though. That must have been a bizarre. Yeah. So you're you're on a level playing field almost. Yeah. We, we really had probably the best time we ever had uh -huh. then. Yeah. You know, kind of toward the end. Yeah. Because you do talk about a moment in the book where you, you finally give it to him a little bit. I gave it to him at the very end when he was in the hospital actually yeah. dying and he you know so he's hooked up to tubes and bags and you know and and I've always had this thing where you know my name is Loudon Wainwright the 3rd which yeah. is a kind of a pretentious <laughs> it, it's my actual name but, yeah but so he said when my career started he said well you should you should use the 3rd because we don't want to have any confusion about which Loudon is which right so I agreed to that. Yeah. But then I realized soon after that yeah. that he didn't use junior. Yeah. So I said, and I then I waited 20 years, but yeah. finally he's dying. <laughs> I said, you know, Dad, I just got to say something. This the Roman numeral thing, and the, you did not use the junior thing. So you were just playing old Loud and Wainwright. Yeah. And then he said, you can have the name when I'm dead, <laughs> which shut me up pretty good. <laughs> Is that poetry? See yeah. the poetry that goes right through it too. Yeah. So, what were your choices? Like, I, I, I you know, you chose to be a musician, and you you went to these private schools, which must have been a nightmare. But uh, when did you choose? Like, how was the the culture changing that made you want to do it? Well, I went to Carnegie, which is where I met McKean. And, but, that, but it must have happened before, right? Well, the, the playing was, but I didn't think I was going to be an actual musician, although I played in folk bands in boarding school and things. But but I, I dropped out of college. I was a hippie in San Francisco for about two years. I got busted in uh, 67 for in Oklahoma. You were a hippie in, like the late, in which years? I was there in the summer of love. Donald so Fagan beginning. and I lived in a crash pad and, along with some other people. Did you meet him in San Francisco? Yeah. Fagan? That's where I met him. I had met him earlier. My, my girlfriend at that time, 
had friends at Bard, so yeah. he was at Bard, and that that summer they went out to. It's so weird. Like, like I know that he's like a great musician and a funny guy and a cynical writer, but I never locked into the Steely Dan thing. Really? Well, I mean, I can listen to it. I know the good songs. Uh huh. You know, but like in terms of like complete nerding out, which it seems like they're a band where there's just people who are full on, yeah, Steely Dan nerds. I am a I am a huge Steely Dan. Sure. Fan. In fact, once I asked Donald because I I kind of know him and I yeah. know his wife, Libby Titus, and I I I asked him if he would, would produce one of my records for me. Yeah. He said no. no. <laughs> 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 kind of kind of crushed me. So, but uh, I'm a huge fan. I love those records. But yeah, I, I know that a lot of people don't. You know. I, I'm 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 coming around. I know that I know the ones I grew up with. It's very like, controlled. Yes. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, I, I do like things it's nailed. Messy. It's nailed down. Yeah, it's almost it's it's almost like uh, s- sterilized. I, I don't know. I find the 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 great stuff, and there's a lot of it. The yeah. songs are very sad. I mean, the writing and his as a vocalist, I think Fagan is. One of the great singers. No, I, I I agree. I agree. So you guys, you kept in touch a little bit. A bit. We see each other every every once in a while. Yeah. I I don't. I forgive him for not wanting to produce my record. Well, you got Richard Thompson to do it. That's not nothing. That's right. All right. So the summer of love. Like, what was that like? Were you a, a, a acid guy, drug guy? Acid. Oh yeah. Yeah. The good Get, stuff. Owsley. Yeah, it was pretty. It, we would drop acid in the morning and then just kind of wander around Golden Gate Park. Ah. talk to the the bison at the Buffalo Pen there. And, yeah, and uh, you know, saw so, saw so free concerts with the Grateful Dead and the Big Brother and the whole. Did you hang out with those guys at all? I no, because I was just a lowly. You know, you weren't even a guy. No, yet. I wasn't a guy yet. Yeah. You know, uh, you're just one of the the the, the hippie uh, yeah, yeah. masses. Yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> you know, I would go to the Haight Ashbury Free Clinic to get broken glass taken out of my foot. I mean, oh, that was one of those right. guys. Yeah, because you're yeah. walking around sure on drugs sure. with no <laughs> shoes. A great idea in a major city. But you were a kid, right? I mean, how old were you? Well, uh, sixty-seven. 20? I was. T- I, yeah, I wasn't a total kid. I was twenty-one. But that, but you know, like I, I guess when I talk to guys who you know come uh, of age as musicians at that time, I mean, you were there with this like cataclysmic shift, two or three of them really in music, right? Mm-hmm. So I mean, you grew up and it was put the end of you know what would have been sort of big bandy, I would imagine, when you were a kid, and then rock and roll starts and happens, right? I and saw. then and then all of a sudden it just completely shifts. In the late 60s, mm-hmm. into folk and then whatever, you know, acid yeah. and speed yeah. <laughs> yielded. Right. Whatever the drugs that were being taken. Right. But right. the Beatles, like, I mean, you were like, uh, a, a, like a very impressionable person when that shit went down. Yeah. No, I loved all the, you know, the Beatles and the Stones and, of course, Dylan. I mean, when I, and when I started to play the guitar and, and, and sing, the folk boom was happening. Yeah. It didn't last very long, but... It for, didn't, though. It didn't really, did it? It lasted about two years. Yeah. And the Newport Folk Festival was the grooviest thing, but then electric music, when, when Bob plugged in... Right. ...reasserted its power... <laughs> but but that that is, is that how you look at it? Like it's like you know we had a good thing going, and then you know you had to bring electricity into it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it left a lot of a lot a lot of folkies in the dust. I mean, I, I loved when Dylan went electric. I yeah, it was very powerful and exciting and great. Like because like I read Dylan's book, you know the the strange autobiography, the Chronicles. Yeah, which was great. Like I think some of the best stuff in it was. His, you know, depiction of that scene. Mm-hmm. So, like after, so I'm assuming you go, you you went to San Francisco, did your acid, right? And uh, did you run away, or did you <laughs> from San Francisco? Or well, I was arrested in Oklahoma on my way back. Uh, uh, yeah, and for then, what? For possession of uh, marijuana. <laughs> yeah, and um, <laughs> and then I started to uh, write songs. Yeah, and uh, but. And with an acoustic guitar, with not with an electric guitar. Right. So and then I went and sang in these little hoots and open mic things in Cambridge and in New York. But did you have to do jail time? I was in jail for five day for five days and nights. Just for weed. Yeah, but they were they were they were very excited because they found out that my dad was the famous Life Loud. magazine writer. So they were talking about ten years. 
Oh, o- so th- in Oklahoma City, yeah. But they wanted to, they, because of that, I thought they were going to give you a break. I thought you wasn't. No, gonna... and then my dad, he, he was living in London then, and he had to, so he had to take two long airplanes, you know, one to New York and then yeah. one down to Oklahoma City. And he got a lawyer and he has, he knew a judge in New York and basically he used his influence and money to get my ass out of jail. They Which, really And want... I was about to get jumped on my ass. <laughs> yeah. Because I was in a tank with, with, you know, it was a, it was a county jail in Oklahoma City. Uh huh. At night we would, we would sleep uh, with a roommate, but in the day it was you know forty guys milling around. Really, yeah. so it was pretty uh, kind of hard time for five days. It, for for a preppy kid from from northern Westchester, it was <laughs> it scared the hell out of me. I still have nightmares about it. Do you really? Yeah. So then, and so was, I was cute. Yeah, I was really cute. Yeah, I saw I those those tall. album covers, those yeah, early was, album covers. Yeah, yeah was, you're a looker, man. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you weren't exuding alpha strength. No, they they were going to jump on me. So my dad got me out, and then and that kind of straightened me up. And uh-huh. then, then I started into music. So you say you you were doing hoots? Is that what they were called? Hoots, open nights. You know, you'd go and play three songs for a lot of other singer songwriters and some Japanese tourists. But you were going up to Cambridge, and you were in New York. You went back to New York. Back and, and forth. I went back and forth to Cambridge, and in between Cambridge and New York. So that was the folk scene, Cambridge. That and New was York. the folk scene, and then. Because I know you talk about seeing Phil von Ronk and those guys, and like, was this was this the the heart of it, or were you were the the big folk stuff had, had gone right? You know, Dylan had gone electric, so the early Bleecker Street, McDougal Street, you know, Dave van Ronk, Dave, right, yeah, um, uh, Phil Oaks, Dylan, Richard Farina, uh that was five years before my time. So the remnants of that was going on when I hit the village. In- Who was the remnants? Well, you know, there was still Eric Anderson. I don't know if you know who he he was. He was a good singer song. Uh-huh. He's a good singer song. Uh-huh. John Hammond Jr. was I around. love him. Well, John Hammond Jr. Uh, I did a lot of shows with him at the Gaslight. So you're okay. So you're doing that folk thing, and then you know how does uh, the second tier, the second wave of the folk thing, and what and what happens? Well, what happens is I'm I'm opening a show at the Village Gaslight on McDougal Street for John Hammond Jr. Yeah. And a guy called Brian Keating, who was writing for the Village Voice, wrote this ridiculously ecstatic review. Uh You know, uh, this guy is the next guy. Yeah. And that's what happens with comedians or musicians or actors. You know, they they get pounced on if they're good. Yeah. And and when there was one or two papers that meant something, and there was no other input. And within six months, I had a record deal at Atlantic Records. My struggle was so brief, it was ridiculous. I mean, I did not pay any dues. <laughs> but in that song on, uh, I think it's history, the Bob Dylan riff, the Talking Blues structured song. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talk about that there was the, that there was a sort of a, 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 a big rush to sign Dylan types. Yeah, because it, he was out of commission. For one thing, he had had his motorcycle accident. Right. So male singer songwriters were really, you know, they were signing them left and right. So and, you said that it was you, Prine, Springsteen. Yeah, we we I used to joke that we we should start a, a, a you know a, a new Bob Dylan club. Sure, and meet every year at Bruce's house. And you should and have burgers. He's got a nice house out there. He's got a good house. Yeah, he does. Are yeah. you friends with him? I have never met Bruce Springsteen. I've seen him play a couple of times, but I've never met him. I saw him way at the beginning of his career. You guys are all workers. You know what I mean? I mean that's that's the wild thing about the life you've led. And as a comic, I know that that you know you go out there with your guitar, and you're still out there with your guitar. Yeah. And ultimately, I'm one. I, whatever level you're doing that at, that's what you're doing. Yeah. Right. No, so that's the, that's the last chapter in my book, the seventy-five to ninety. It's it's about the job of. Going and playing for seventy-five to ninety minutes, in, in, in most, in my case, a lot of the time in clubs, you know. And I've been right. doing it for almost fifty years. So, all right. So you get signed. All yeah. you guys, are you friends with Prine? I've talked to him. I am. I am friends with Prine. It's great. You guys He's, are like you write very uh, you know, beautiful and clever songs with a little little bite to them, a little humor, yeah. a, little, a little jab in the heart. Were you, were you a Steve Goodman fan? I, I, you know, I know about Steve. Like, he, you know, I don't like some of this music is is familiar to me from my childhood, and I know about the, you know, the couple of hits. But I, and somebody sent me a lot of that stuff, yeah, and he I know was he, great. And he and Prine were kind of yeah, they were buddies. Yeah, he they, close. from uh, the Chicago scene, right? Right, right. But so you get the record deal, and what was the uh, what was the expectation? Well, 
uh, they, they pretty let, much let me do what I wanted to do. That would be Atlantic Records. Nestle Erdogan signed me. So my first record is, I took seven months to make, and it's totally voice and guitar. It's not. Right. Uh, loud and One. Loud and One is just straight ahead, just the songs. Got great reviews, and nobody bought it. <laughs> So then it came time for the second album, which interestingly mm-hmm. enough was called Album Two. Yeah, good, good thought on that. Good yeah. creativity and on the title. And that uh, again, there was a harmonica on that, and I did a duet with my wife, my then wife Kate McGarrigal. But the rest of the record is all voice and guitar, and one song on the piano, and no, and great reviews, and nobody bought that one. Yeah. So Atlantic dropped me. Columbia, Clive Davis signed me, and then I, I. These are big guys. So it was Ahmet or the other or his brother. Well, Nessui signed me. Right. Okay. Uh, but then Clive signed me to uh, another big guy, Columbia. Yeah. And uh, then I, then the Dead Skunk thing happened. They put me together with a rock rock band. Why are you laughing? Yeah, I like that way. I like the way you said it. Well, yeah. This, was, was it not meant to be funny? It was a thing. I yeah. mean, you know, it was a thing. It was number one in Little Rock, Arkansas, for six weeks. There you go. Now you found your people, man. Yeah, I, I, I've always imagined Bill and Hillary kind of making out in a Rambler the station skunk, wagon, the dead, dead skunk, skunk, skunk on the radio. <laughs> yeah, but that was a, a free thing, right? Well, what it was, was freaking that it, it's been my only hit so far. <laughs> uh huh. No, it was a big, big record, and and the but then that problem was that then I was the skunk guy, so where's the next funny animal song? So then you have the problem of. But was there pressure? Yeah, there was, and I and I from was Clive in the in the brass. And- yeah, but then then the next thing I did was I made a record with Bob Johnston, you know, who produced Blonde on Blonde and Leonard Cohen's records and all the some of the great Dylan records in oh, yeah. Nashville. We made a record in four days with all those guys, and but it didn't have a funny animal song on it. But that, but, but that's sort of like wasn't there a certain amount of like because you're writing, you, you know, I mean, you're 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 doing, you know, real, you know, kind of soulful folk music, and you're, you're writing, you know, clever songs that, that that tell a certain truth about the human condition. And now you got this skunk song, but you're still like, the, how did you not get uh, angry and start drinking? And I, I did. <laughs> don't don't worry, I did. I started to drink and philander, and my my marriage broke up. And this, this is the marriage to to Kate, Kate yeah. and that's who that's Rufus's mom that's and Martha's Ruf- mom. Rufus and Martha's mom. I've met them oh. at different points in my life. So there you were, you, you know, the skunk song didn't repeat itself, and and now you're you're just a, a guy, not selling records. Well, I had a career n- not selling records, but the, yeah. but I, I still you know continue to work, and then uh, Clive. Signed me again to Arista when when he went to Arista, so in '78 I just stopped trying to. I was kind of half-heartedly trying to make what they called radio-friendly records. Yeah, you know the records that were somewhat produced. Sure. But then I started again and and just started to put out uh, you know voice and guitar records and I made those records with Richard Thompson, which were kind of stripped down. And yeah. So the the production on the records served the songs, and I think. Generally, I've managed to do that for the last for the last thirty something years. Well, when you look back on it, like you know, I noticed in the book that you talk about like philandering or the road or or what have you, is you know, and that you have done or tried to do, and what that did to your family. I mean, you, I, I, I'm just trying to put my finger on it, like because like when you do these things in songs, you know, when you do songs, you know, about this kind of stuff. You know, right. about truth, about about hitting your kid, about your relationship with your father or, or fathers in general, about, you know, whatever the darker songs you have, the more touching mm-hmm. songs that, you know, that song is that three or four minutes, you know, but you still have this, you know, a life where you, I imagine, you know, you have a full range of emotions and mm-hmm. and, and and you're a decent fella, but but it, it's, it's just interesting when you're defined by your music because there... I, I don't know wh- whether I read it uh, or, or I'm just projecting it. That how close do you feel to the protagonists of your songs in general? Well, I feel I, I wouldn't pretend that it's. Uh, I feel close. To, it's it's me. You know, it is. It's, it's a kind of crystallized, polished. I mean, although it talks about some of my less appealing traits sometimes yeah, right. but it is me i've i it's been it's it's the it's the waterfront that i've covered uh-huh. my life my family my kids my parents my sister there's songs about all these people because these are the people that uh 
mean a lot to me. And then quite, they're quite particular, and I don't really write generic uh, love songs. I admire people that can do that. Yeah. Or even other people that have kind of cryptic things where you're not quite sure what they're writing about. Right. Like Dylan, or even Steely Dan, for that matter. Sure. You're never quite sure what they're, what it's about. Yeah. But my tendency, and I don't, don't know why, because it's just the way that I write. Everybody develops a style. But I write very straight ahead. It's very descriptive. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And a lot of it, I mean, I do write sometimes political songs and straight ahead novelty songs, but a lot of it are, is about my family and my life. Well, which is interesting because it's like, you know, a lot of Prine songs are not, he makes characters. Yeah. I don't get, do that much. So that, you yeah, right. So there's, the, those are the choices. Either you write cryptic songs that people can just, you know, kind of use as a template to feel whatever they're going to feel mm-hmm. without having any kind of, you know, not knowing what it means. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have like st- songs about people you make up. And then, then there's guys who do the straight stuff. You're like the straight guy. You're the, you go right to the heart of it. You're doing the memoir song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, baby. The real deal. <laughs> That's it. I'm the real deal. I'm the real damn deal. <laughs> but like when you're writing as a kid, you know, when you wrote, you know, Loud and One and stuff, you, you know, you, you must have had in your mind, you were judging yourself against, you know, Dylan or whatever, right? Yeah. And you're like, I got to, I got to nail this thing. Well, I had to figure out, like, again, like everybody else in show business, when you start, you've got to figure out. Uh, what to look like and, uh, you know, how to separate yourself from the pack. How'd you do with that? Well, I, I, I assumed that I took, I took up the costume of my youth. I, I looked like, I had short hair. If you yeah. look at that first album, everybody else had long hair and, and bell bottom pants. Right. I had kind of a Brooks brother blazer and, and gray flannel pants. Yeah. And, uh, so right away there was a, a different look. Right. And then, uh, I started to sing a lot about myself. So you're a preppy-ish. Yeah, pre- preppy psycho killer look. Right, not Kingston trio. No, 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 mm. that would have, no, no, no. That That's too, or that's <laughs> late 50s. Right, no. but they were all pretty clean cut, seemed preppy-ish, yeah. right? And, yeah. And, but striped shirts, I think, as yeah, I recall. Yeah, no, I would never wear a striped shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them what I'm wearing today. That's a nice uh, plaid, I, a nice multicolored plaid. Thank I, you. It is striped. I, oh, it's, oh it's, I thought there was, oh, it's not a plaid, it's striped shirt. <laughs> Fashion on the radio is great, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not Kingston Trio. Style. No, no, no. That, that, that's a vertical. They, they were short sleeve shirts. Yeah, the yeah, Kingston Trio. Oh, thank God, because they all matched exactly. You know? Yeah, that, that was the big mistake. So, all right. So you're doing these records. The Skunk Song happens. You know, you have this relationship with the label with Clive Davis. Or what? What? What's happening around you in music at that point? What are you up against? Because like you've you've really you know kept going. Yeah. <laughs> But and, and at different times, music is changing around yeah. you constantly. But you you're locked into uh, Americana music, one you know folk or or you know country ish. I write the songs on an acoustic guitar. Yeah. you know, usually record them with that, and it's the same five chords that I learned when I was fifteen. What happened was I just kept my head down and kept writing songs. Right, but when when, when did things get bad? Like, at what point did, did the family structure start to, the vessel start to kind of shake? Uh, you, you know, like, in terms of, you, you know, you put these records out, you're not selling records, you've got to be on the road. Mm-hmm. You're you're building a following, however right. you're doing it. Right, And And at some point, you said that you started drinking and that you did get bitter, and that made it into the music a bit, but yeah. it didn't seem to sink you. No, no, I, I, you know, I didn't have, I have, I've had a pretty good time actually. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've, I, you know, I've, I've, uh, uh there's some, in, like, in, like anybody's life, there's collateral damage. Sure. You know, but I've, I've really, it, it hasn't been bad for me. Yeah. You know, I, I haven't been severely depressed. Uh, right. Or, or I had a nervous, pr- when my mother died in 97, I, I kind of fell apart, but that was, that was appropriate. Normal. Sure. Natural. So, so by and large, you know, I just kept my head down and did the job and I liked playing and, and that's still what I'm kind of doing. And how, and what is your, how, how does your, how did your following evolve? How did you find that you got the people, the fan base? What did they come for? And how long have they been with you? Well, a lot of them have been with, with me for the ride. I mean, and sometimes I'm shocked when I see my, my, you know, I drive up to the club and I see these old people. I think they're there for the bingo. Yeah. Right. I mean, 
but th- then it's dark and they're so beautiful and warm and they yeah. love me. And but then other things happen, you know. We mentioned Judd. I mean, I, I did this. Uh, I was in this show that Judd Apatow did, uh, Undeclared. Yeah. So as a result of something like that, all of a sudden there were young people there. Uh-huh. So or fans of my of my son and Rufus and uh-huh. Martha or something. Uh, so, so you know, occasionally there's uh, some uh, young people up there. Sure, but it must be it must be wild because, like, you know, have you had that experience where? <laughs> I mean, how old are you? Do you mind? Seventy one. So you're seventy one, and you know you've had you've had a good go at it. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've 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 lived your life. Do you have that moment where you go back to places and a woman comes up to you and goes, "Do you remember me?" Yeah, that's happened. Yes, and invariably, <laughs> no, I don't. But I say, of course I do. And my line is, through the mists of time, here we are. And, uh, no, that just happened to me, actually. Yeah? Yeah. Like with somebody your age? Uh, Yeah, somebody my age. It's wild, right? And a very nice person. And uh, so I said hello and apologized, and we let it go at that. (laughs) <laughs> you apologize. I, I didn't apologize. That's she right. apologized. Well, that well, that's funny though because like you're not like I, I guess like the assumption about how a performer lives on the road, you, you know, you're not some sort of crazy party dude. You know, you weren't like some, not anymore. No, yeah, you're not some dangerous, weird, uh, <laughs> junkie or freak out there. You're folk guy. Right. And you're out there getting laid just like anybody else. Yeah. But they must be. Uh, I'm just picturing just pleasant, uh, pleasant ladies. By and large, they were very pleasant, <laughs> as I recall. <laughs> they were human beings. Sure. Because they're not, they, like, you know, they're responding to something yeah. very, you know. But pure. I hasten to say we're laughing about it, but it's important to point out, at least for me, is that a, a lot of it created a, a guilt and b- bad feelings and feeling like an idiot and a jerk and a, a, an abuser of power. You know, to and and again, it it in terms of my domestic life. You know, I had the, the marriage with Kate, then I was with uh, Suzy Roach for nine years, and we had a daughter. So those marriages were were kind of smashed up because of my goofing around on uh, the road. A lot of it, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't like your dad; you weren't hiding like seven year relationships necessarily. Uh, I didn't do that. You know, I, I would hide like two week relationships, and right. again, a lot of times. Uh, we're talking about my proclivities a lot, but again, the nature of the job is you go to some town. It's 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 not a relationship at all. It's a you know someone yeah. to go home with, right? So you don't have to face the television set. But but also it's like it's surprising as somebody who well performed. doesn't that happen in your world? Sure, it must. of course. Uh, you know, I I mean, I ruined uh, a mar- uh, the, my first marriage like that. But I uh, but I don't have um, I don't have children. I never did that. It's a, I, I don't feel terrible about it. But, yeah, I mean, there's something profoundly lonely about a hotel room. I don't know what it is, but, you know, when you're on the road, even if it's for a night, you're like, what? what is going on? Where am I? And you've just am- made love to 300 or 3,000 people I get, who've right. adored you. Right. I guess I don't put, factor that in all the time. Yeah, like, so, you've done a thing. Right. And then you, so you, just, so you kind of take a hostage <laughs> back to the hotel, a love hostage. <laughs> yeah. And they're they're excited. They are. They they're into it. They're, yeah. you know. But what? But you've talked. You sing about this stuff, and it 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 has there. There has been like kind of a you know tension that you know. I mean, Rufus came out at you with a song, and I think Martha came at you with a song. Yeah. And there's you know there was like, uh, and I imagine why wouldn't they? You're their dad. You right. do it. Right. I mean, you've been writing about them since they were infants. Yeah. No, so, it's all you know. If you you, you got to take it if you're going to dish it out. And and Rufus and Martha, uh, you know, have certainly uh, taken shots. And uh, I can take it. You know? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's uh, Martha wrote this um, song. Uh, it, uh, you, I, you can swear on your radio. Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah. So bloody motherfucking right. Asshole. Yeah. So for for a while, you know, when she used to play, she used to open shows for me in the beginning of her career. So. She uh, would do this song, and I thought I would think, boy, uh, she was going out at the time with a singer called Dan Byrne. Uh-huh. I don't know if you know who he is. Re- a really talented singer, a bit older than her. Uh-huh. And they had a tough, difficult relationship. Yeah. So I thought, boy, that's a tough song about Dan, you bloody <laughs> motherfucking asshole. Yeah. So then we're in Paramus, New Jersey, mm. and Martha goes out, and it's to you know it's my audience in in the in the in the room mm-hmm. primarily because yeah. her career is still moving up. 
So she announces to my audience that this is a song about my dad and then sings Bloody Motherfucking Asshole. So that was a moment <laughs> that I was... Let's bring up Hello! <laughs> yes. How was that when you got up on stage? Uh, uh, well, I just made a joke. I can't you? remember. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just got through it. Wait, why'd she just, so she decided to lay that on you and you had no idea and what, what happened after that? Show? Martha's very provocative. I, I'm, I'm sure she would agree with that. She yeah. likes to push the envelope. Sure. I, I, agree, I, I think that's a good thing to do. Performers need to sure. wake people up, shake people up. Even if it's her dad. Even if it's her dad. <laughs> Before he goes you know? on and, in front uh, of his audience. Yeah. But, but it seemed like it was almost like a secret she was keeping for a while because she was playing it. Yeah. And then at some point she decided, like, well, he, I can't let him think that it's not about him. Right. No. Yeah. And then, and then, but you never, there was never a point where you guys weren't talking to each other. Oh, no? we've got, we've been there. We've been there. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Let's see. Am I talking to Rufus this week? <laughs> now, I have another daughter who's an incredible mu musician that yeah. I want to talk about, Lucy, Lucy Wayne, right? Yes. Roach, my daughter with Suzzy. Yeah. And she has. From the has, Roaches, right? Yeah. Well, Lucy has not written a song attacking me yet, and I really appreciate uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. and, but that's not her style anyway. Yeah, but sometimes I think it's that first uh, group Could of happen, kids. Could happen, though. Sure. But I think it's the first group of kids that all, that think they get the raw end of the stick yeah. the, the most. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In general? Yeah. But Rufus, like, is a spectacular performer and songwriter. And, you know, his, like, I, his song about you, I guess, is what, Dinner at Eight? Yeah. And that's a, it's a sad song. That's a beautiful song. It is. It really is. And it's sad. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but I think it's a great song. It's one of his great songs. Well, when you, when you process this stuff, what do you think your best album is for you? What's the one that you're like, that was, I really nailed it all the way through on that one? Uh, well, I've made 27 albums. I, I think, uh, and, and you know, some people, and I've made some duds, that's for sure, are albums that I don't really like. Yeah. I, I think there's an album called History that I made in, uh, it was right after my dad died. Yeah. And that event was such a cataclysmic, uh, thing. These songs started to come out that I, and I think they're some of my best songs. Yeah. It's a great record. Yeah. It's a great record. And then my, when my mother died, I, I made a record called Last Man on Earth. And a lot of that, unfortunately, I only have two parents. Yeah. But you know, those, those are two very strong records of mine. Yeah. Yeah, history is like history is like beautiful, and I think didn't you do one of your father's songs on yes. that? Yes, my dad wrote a song. Um, there was a guy that he my my dad lived. We lived in L.A. for for a bit in the early fifties, and Dad was a friend with uh -huh. Terry Gilkison, who was a a folk singer and a, but a a pop folk singer. He had a group. They sang backup on Dean Martin records, like Memories Are Made of This. They oh, had, they were that weird Hawaiian bunch? Well, they, they were Well, it was, it was folky, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. They sang a song called The Wild Goose. Well, that that song, Memories, has a weird little uke, it's yeah. a uke thing. Yeah. Going. Yeah, yeah. But Terry Gilkison yeah. and my father were drinking buddies. Uh -huh. and, and and I think dad, my dad took a shot at writing some songs, ha hanging out with him. And he wrote a great song. About 1950, so yeah. he would have been t 25. Yeah. Called it "Man Is Just a Handful of Dust," and that that song is on uh, history. I guess I'm sort of fascinated at, at your self awareness and about because I, I wrestle with the, some of the same things you do. Now, do, is is there redemption after this when you say that you look back or in the moment or or whatever wreckage you've 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 reaped on anybody? Do you? You just have an acceptance around it that it eventually resolves itself if, if you don't make it worse, or or do you do you still kind of like you just think you're propelled by that? By is there still guilt and you know self hatred and that kind of stuff? Yeah, but but you know it, I'm get, there's also there is redemption and forgiveness. And, yeah, you know I mean my kids are you know my youngest daughter whose name is Alexandra she's 25 but I mean Rufus is 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 40. Four and Martha's forty and Lucy's thirty-five. And they all have kids, or uh, Rufus and Martha have kids. So you know, but they're all grown-ups. They've been banged around in the world, and yeah. so so the, there's some forgiveness floating around. Uh, you're right, and right. that and that that that's what I've. You know, one of the things I did in my book was I, I included some of the my father's writing. He was a yeah. beautiful, elegant writer. Some of his essays are in the book. And I love the, you know, uh, he and I had a kind of a crappy relationship, but he died t more than 25 years ago. So there's a forgiveness thing that's going on now between me and him, even though he's been 
uh, dead. And and if you can't forgive your parents, I'm talking to my kids now. If you can't forgive your parents, you can't forgive yourself. That's my that's my theory at this point. And that and, and but you learn that the hard way. You make a lot of mistakes, and I made plenty of mistakes. I mean, it wasn't, but it wasn't any more than anybody else. Well, I just yeah. wrote about it. Yeah. I had a couple of broken marriages, and I screwed around. I mean, that's it. No, I know, I, I know. Like I I, I use that one too. Um, like in the sense that, you know, it, there is a short menu to, to transgression, yeah, to, yeah. You, you know, and there's, of course there's a big range, yeah. but you know, certainly there are ones that sort of, there's nothing unusual. I didn't drown any puppies. Or no, right. Like yeah. That. And you didn't, uh, you know, bankrupt a country or yeah. kill anybody. Right. 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 You know, you kind of like judge yourself on the, the moral transgression chart and how familiar it is culturally. Yeah. And you're like, look, you know, people fuck up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so so please forgive me, kids. <laughs> I'm saying this on the radio, but you also re- you seem to wrestle with the very idea of uh, of love. Yeah, love. Yeah, like I do material that's similar to this, and and I'm trying to like get, glean from you because I'm a little younger than you. You know wh- how you resolve some of that stuff. I mean, like, do you? Because I feel like I'm capable of love. Yeah. You know, of, of giving, but there's something that holds me back. Yeah. And, and in terms of guilt and, and whatever, but like, how have you, I imagine having kids changes that. Well, I have a song called uh, 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 All in the Family. Yeah. It's All in the Family. And that is about love, you know, um, love heals heartache and familial pain and what family is not insane. Uh-huh. You know, so the, I, I've been, love has been working its way into the songs in the last 10 or 20 years. You feel, with, you feel it with age and grandkids? Yeah, I think <laughs> gra- grandkids, yeah. You know, and you do uh-huh. realize that, uh, you know, it's kind of corny, but the, 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 the L, the love thing is a big thing. Do you ever feel pointlessness? Um, is that a, th- a theme? Well, well, I mean, I wrote a song when I was 25 on my second album called The Suicide Song. Yeah. But, it's a you long know, time ago. It was a long time ago, and I was kind of goofing around anyway. Right. I wasn't really... The worst I ever felt was after my mother died. I really went down hard on How old that. were you? 50. I was, uh-huh. Oh, right. I was 51 or something. So you'd already gone through a lot of your stuff, too. Yeah, I, I'd had, a lot had happened to me, and, and my father had died earlier, and that, that was a, uh, more of a release for me when yeah. he died. When my mo- when my mother died, the the bottom went out. And what what, what was the was the feeling? Just sort of like you know, like a void. Yeah, uh, I I couldn't get out of bed. You know, I yeah. mean, I I've been mildly yeah. depressed for my entire adult life. Sure, but this was the real thing. Yeah, you know, I I was really, but it, but with time. Yeah, and seeing a shrink. Yeah, and some you know lorazepam. I I got back on my feet. Again. Yeah. Oh, good, good. <laughs> and you made. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit before we we wrap it up. I, I know you got to do stuff. The uh, the acting and the uh, the sort of TV thing. I had no idea until I looked it up today that you you were actually involved with the the original David Letterman daytime show. Is that true? Yeah, I was uh, the uh, musician sidekick on the couch for the first week. And, 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 and that show didn't last that long. Is that what happened? No. I, well, they, they did me for a week, and then they thought this isn't great. And then they tried some other guests, and then then they they shifted over to to, to late night and brought Paul Schaefer in, I guess. And like, what was somebody? Because you did act here and there. Like, I mean, how how did that? Who was drag? You know, bringing you into that? Like, you 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 knew the. Like you knew Christopher Guest and McKean and those guys when they had the uh, uh, the sketch of Spinal Tap, correct? Yeah, I was in Spinal Tap. In the, in the, the movie? In, in the sketch. In the sketch. It was in a Rob Reiner uh, a TV special called The TV Show. Martin Mull was in it. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, and uh, Harry Shearer was in it. Uh-huh. And, and the, the, they, they came up with this sketch about a heavy metal band. I was the keyboard player. <laughs> right. You can see me on YouTube. Oh, right? yeah? In a wig, yeah. Yeah. So, so you always sort of were. These were your close friends. So you were sort of, you know, in proximity to comedy all the time. Yeah, yeah. You're always kind of like around. Yeah. And when you met when you met those guys, you okay, you went to college with some of them, but but you you met uh, you saw like in the in the city, like you you were there pre SNL, right? 
Yeah, when I met when I met I met Chris when he was in this thing called Lemmings. Oh, the National Lampoon Radio Hour. Right. Thing? Yeah. So that was pre, you know, on Belushi and Chevy Chase, and and this was uh, two years before Saturday Night Live. And you saw that perform live? Yeah. Where'd they perform that? Like the, at the at the Village Vanguard. Oh, really? Which was on Bleecker Street. Yeah, sure, sure. It was great. It was amazing. It was incredible. That was the, like actually. the dark uh, festival, the yeah. the rock festival. Yeah, that yeah. was the satirical right. answer to Woodstock. That's right, where they all would just go off the edge of the cliff. Right. So you saw Belushi as a young crazy. Yeah, he, I, he's, I think he did his Joe Cocker impression. Right. Of course. Right. Of course. And Chris did incredible Dylan and. A wonderful actress who's no longer alive. Alice Platon was in it. And yeah. Gary Goodrow and a lot of great and Chevy. A lot of great people. And you did you did SNL early on too, right? I was in the first season. I was in the third show. Robert Klein was the host. Yeah. And the other musical act was ABBA. Really? And nobody knew who they were. They had just won the Eurovision Song Contest, and they they were the only group I, I'm told yeah. that ever lip sank. On Saturday Night Live. That first time? They did it then, and, and Lorne decided that would never happen again. Was there chaos at the show? Was it everyone excited? Was there, like, uh, like I can't imagine that first season. Because it, it was more of a variety show, and there was a... Uh, it didn't... It, it, they had fil- short films and, you know, more No, singers. it was great. It was, you know, with the, all the original cast. Yeah. I remember, I remember the the party after the show we did. Oh, yeah. Everybody was talking about things and yeah going off to the bathroom every once in a while sure yeah <laughs> what was that did you do carson or any of those shows i did i did carson uh yeah. twice uh once with johnny and once with doc severinson guest hosting uh, yeah yeah and i did you know i've done uh i did the mike douglas show are you old oh, enough to remember yeah, sure. that i used to watch it after school they sit around the half circle right yeah, yeah. I, did a lo- I did a lot of mike douglas shows oh yeah i did merv griffin oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah and you, shows i have done yeah just but sitting there with guys it, like to me you know like I, I like thinking back on those talents you know at that time it just everything seemed to be more like a community yeah, yeah. like everybody seemed to know each other is that was am I making that up or do you feel that too? Like you sitting out there like on a on a like a Merv Griffin show and there'd be some comic there and some other guy there, but yeah, it, show business felt small I, to me. I think it was a little looser, maybe. Uh huh. You know, and I don't think that people were, but right. but there were egos flying around and sure and and, and crap and bullshit. But, yeah, yeah. But I, 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 you know, and and uh, it was a long time ago. How'd you do Mash? How'd that happen? Larry Gelbart saw me playing at the Troubadour in L.A in 73 or something yeah. and said hey how about an idea of a singing surgeon and i did three episodes of mash <laughs> that's that's fun yeah it was fun and then all of a sudden you got judd uh, you know uh, putting you in everything judd has been incredible yeah and, um what was the first thing he put you in Undecl- uh, undeclared. undeclared. Yeah. yeah. He, when he was a 14 year old kid growing up in Sayas at Long Island, he yeah. saw me on that Letterman show. Yeah. Then he used to come into town and see me play at the bottom line. When he was a kid? When, when yeah, well, probably. When, well, then he was like 18 or 19. Oh, so he's been a fan a long he's time. He's been a fan a long time. Yeah. And then I got this call about 12 years ago from, and I never, I didn't, had no idea who he was. I had not seen Freaks and Geeks. Uh-huh. It was weird. Today, I, I got on a plane from this morning in New York, and Martin Starr was sitting oh, like next to me. He's we a great guy. about Judd and, yeah. and Freaks and Geeks. And Martin Starr is an intense dude. He's a good yeah. guy. He slept most of the way. But oh, okay. I could tell he was intense. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. intense. Yeah. So, so he puts you on Undeclared, and then he, you know, Yeah, and then, you know, I gave me some parts in uh, some other movies, and then I wrote with Joe Henry, my friend Joe Henry. Uh, we wrote the music for Knocked Up and uh, good stuff from Judd. Yeah, and you did that cover your of uh, another friend's song, right, Daughter? Peter Blakevad. Yeah. Yes, great. Who's song. that guy? That guy is a really interesting guy. He he's uh, he's an expatriate. He's an American, but he's been living in London for almost forty years. He was in a, a rock band in the seventies called Slap Happy. Uh huh. And they played a lot in Europe. He's a great songwriter. He's also an amazing cartoonist and a writer. And uh, hardly anybody knows. Uh, it's a hell of a song. That's a hell of a song. If you Google me, the first thing that comes up is daughter. Uh huh. So I have to always tell people that I didn't write that. Yeah. And, well, it's I a mean, pain in the ass, but, but it's a great song. A, a, at least the skunk things behind you. Yeah, man. That, it used to be skunk. <laughs> now it's daughter. <laughs> you can't get a fair shake on your good shit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, man. Well, it's great talking to you. The book is beautiful. It's well written. It, you know, it's fun. Um, and what 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 happens now? Are you, do you tour constantly? 
I tour regularly, I'd say. Yeah. You know, um, Judd and Chris are talking about maybe getting together. I have this uh, theater show called Surviving Twin, which is my uh, my songs mixed in with my dad's writing, and I've been doing that, and, and so there's some talk that we might do a film of that. So oh, that's, really? that's the next thing that hopefully will happen. You really, you really are emotionally uh, burying the uh, hatch of your dad posthumously. The, the more you forgive, the better you feel. Yeah, that's that. that I just made that up just now. <laughs> that's a bumper sticker, isn't or, it? Or a song? Yeah. Okay, I'll get. I'll go back. You get cracking on that. Okay. Thanks, Wadden. Very nice talking to you. Okay, that was that. The book, liner notes is out. Get it. Get the book. It's good. A life in music. A life in entertainment. Loudon Wainwright. And don't forget, cash is easy to lose and checks take a while to clear. That's why you should use Zelle, a new way to send money to your friends and family from your banking app. Once you've enrolled, the money moves right between almost any U.S. bank accounts and typically arrives in minutes. It's also backed by major banks, which means you can send money confidently. Just go to ZellPay.com, Z-E-L-L-E-P-A-Y.com to learn more. Zell, this is how money moves. Dig it. Can you dig it? Guitar? Guitar, anyone? <laughs> Boomer lives!